Good evening, everyone. My name is Dan, and on behalf of BookSoup, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our virtual event with Kristen Hirsch in conversation with Kathy Valentine discussing Seeing Sideways, a memoir of music and motherhood. For regular updates on upcoming events, please feel free to subscribe to our email newsletter. This evening's virtual event will end with a Q&A. To submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. If you see a question on that list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the Like button, and we will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. Also, please consider supporting our bookstore and Kristen Hirsch and Kathy Valentine by purchasing a copy of today's featured books, Seeing Sideways and All I Ever Wanted, both of which we have signed copies of. Just click on the green purchase button directly below the viewer screen. The link will redirect to our website where you can continue the checkout process. And now a few words about our featured guests. Kathy Valentine is a musician and songwriter known for being part of the all-female band and recent Rock and Roll, rock and roll Hall of Fame inductees, The Go-Go's. She wrote or co-wrote many of the band's best-known songs, including Vacation and Head Over Heels. In addition to playing music and writing songs, Valentine has worked as an actor, public speaker, and spokesperson and producer. In 2017, she created She Factory, an event series to raise money for women-centered nonprofits. She is the recent author of the best-selling memoir, All I Ever Wanted, which you should definitely read if you haven't already. Tonight, she's here to interview our special guest, Kristen Hirsch. Kristen is a solo artist and founding member of the band's Throwing Muses and 50 Foot Wave. She's the author of two previous books, Rat Girl, which was named one of the 10 best rock and roll memoirs ever written by Rolling Stone Magazine, and Don't Suck, Don't Die, Giving Up Vic Chestnut, which was named one of the best rock and roll books of all time by me. <laughs> <laughs> and without further ado, I'm gonna turn the camera over to Kristen and Kathy. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the presentation. All right. Hi, everybody. Hi, Kristen. Hi, sweetheart. Hi. Um, I'm going to start us off, okay? And because I feel like that's my job. And <laughs> I think that I can do this. I think I, I, I can. can. I really do think I can do it. So I want to start out by telling our, our viewer slash listeners that this is this is a really great book. It is really, really great. I um, I have to say, when I read your other book, other books, I did it more, I was reading more as a reader. And this, since writing my own book, I read more as a writer now. Uh -huh. So I was paying a lot of attention to how you write. And I found myself wondering a lot as I was reading, like, how is she going to wrap this up? How is she going to wrap this up? And um, I, I felt like I couldn't foresee what you were going to do, which I think is phenomenal. I mean, to not be able to foreshadow where it's going or what's going to happen or how you're going to do it. And I'm kind of jumping around, but what the last the last section of this book is just extraordinary because all right, I don't even know how to describe it, but I'm going to try. There, there is this kind of theme of water throughout the book. There's a lot of, and it, it recurs in many ways. And the ending, and when I say ending, it's a whole section. It's not like the last chapter or a few pages. But the ending, it brings this whole, It's it kind of embodies that whole water theme because the end comes at you. It like seeps in like water looking for the path of least resistance. It like crashes with these waves of like, whoa, didn't see that coming. More gentle waves. I mean, it was really, really amazing. And then there's these wonderful drops that you realize have been dropped throughout the book, throughout the story, this drip, 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 drip of these thematic, wonderful um, recurring uh, phrases or ideas or con concepts. Uh, and they all come back at the, anyway, I'm just, as a craft noticer, I really loved, and I, yeah. and I have to talk really vaguely because otherwise I'll spoil it and give it away for the people that haven't read it. But if you've read it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And if you haven't read it, I hope that just hearing that 
is enough to make <laughs> you like, really fucking curious to read this book. You do read as a writer. That's impressive. I'm sure that the story arcs in our lives go past unnoticed. But since memoir is an impressionistic, almost function of our psychologies, the series of memories is going to be impressionistic. The most honest way to express that, to write it down, is to let those drips fall in and they define your story arc. And as you say, the water theme, since the four um, voices were the four voices of my sons, they culminate in the baby who has this water problem that I share. We can't seem to get out of the ocean. There's seaweed in my hair right now. We can't leave the ocean. And now he's a, a pro surfer who's in the water. Uh, you know, he's swimming with sharks right now. <laughs> but the, the way water moves is like mercury when you make it one of, you give it a poetic function. When you make it one of these almost seasonal elements of just flipping through and flipping through. And um, it follows that that spiral image that is throughout the book. It's just like, yeah, life is circular. Yeah, we've done this hundred That's times. Right. We're not exactly at the beginning. We've just come back around again. <laughs> Yeah, I never, I never even, I just, that one popped in my mind just then, how the spiral is almost like circling the drain. So it's an, even another water yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, I, the, Whenever I start a book, it's clever for like two years. Uh, and I, I am on the opposite schedules to you. When you're going to bed is when I'm getting up. Because oh I can only remember in that kind of self-hypnosis way if it's not day or night. So, and I get all excited. It's like, I have to book the book. <laughs> I'll get up at 1 a.m., 2 a.m., just so that I can self-hypnotize and remember the textures, the colors, people's voices, what it was like. And I made sure that nothing weird in the book happens when I'm the only witness so that people didn't think I made shit up, that there's <laughs> always bandmates or always family around to, to watch this crazy shit go by and you start to question yourself after a while. How many times have I told this story until it becomes mythology? And then, you know, oh, yeah. you know I can go on YouTube and sometimes see <laughs> our past, which is not healthy. It's better to go back to the, um, the senses, I suppose, the senses that were on, like full on engagement at every juncture and then you get past clever after a while and you get into that i suppose the the straddle of dream and reality which is <clears throat> really essentially who we are well that was another thing that i felt as a writer that i that i kind of learned and and absorbed a little bit was um you know it was it really is a consummate craft that you're showing and and it's it's kind of unnervingly so because it's really unselfconscious. And one thing, I mean, I with my book, what I kept hearing from people is like, oh, you are so brave. You're so brave. And to me, I don't equate bravery with honesty. I just don't. To me, it's just honest is honest. And yeah. and and I felt like that um like the way you, it, it seemed like you weren't working so hard. And I think we were both not afraid to reveal ourselves and our stories, but I felt like that wasn't the effort. But for me, finding the language to do it, I felt like I worked a lot harder at. And I, I learned from reading your book, like maybe the language sh I should, I would like to work on being uh, less, working, trying so hard with my language, because I felt like with yours, that you were revealing yourself, but it wasn't, and with craft, but without tons of effort, trying to, the, the dreaded trying too hard, the TTH, I call yeah, it. Yeah. That, there were a few iterations where I was trying too hard, <laughs> but I'm not sure I allow myself a firm grasp of conversational English. I use words to a different effect, almost as if they're lyrics. So. 
the first few people who read the book <laughs> said, I have no idea what's going on. <laughs> I said, well, yeah. <laughs> I didn't know what was going on. So now you aren't going to know what's going on. Get it? And they're like, yeah, we get it. We don't like it. It's like, <laughs> yeah. Well, hang in there, whoever thinks that. And I think this would be a really good place since we're talking about your writing to maybe, would, would you read some? Oh, yeah, yeah. There? Is that too soon to dive into that? I, I think it's a good spot. <laughs> I can dive right in. A newspaper headline, Jellyfish Apocalypse Not Coming. Well, that's a relief. What the hell is a jellyfish apocalypse? Doesn't matter now, I guess. In the motel room, I pour a boy another bowl of cereal. The pad of paper from the hotel nightstand is placed carefully in front of Wyatt's little pajama legs on the staticky bed sheets, ready. I glance at it. It's a multiple choice checklist. The motel is asking its guests if they're traveling for business, tourism, or other. One of my sons, not sure who, has checked other and written in the blank space next to it, revenge. <laughs> Our bright yellow snake, Sunshine, is now 14 feet long. She plays on the grass with us while the neighbors watch in fear. Rye cooks dinner on a tiny hardware store grill on the same lawn, which, according to our stoner neighbor, is not grass, but he's permanently baked, so we're not sure what to think about that. It is pretty pointy for a lawn. Our tiny piping plover, clover, rides in Bodhi's pocket. Some sunshine. Rider through our dinner smoke. It takes years, but it's gonna be okay, mom. A jellyfish apocalypse. Sunset. The frantic is running out and the tide is coming in. Racing toward the water, I make a plan to swim to the nearest buoy. I'm not going to hear anything but water. Everything will be removed from noise and the world will become wet music. I'm already hearing this washing clean when through it, a man yells into the wind, girl, hey girl. I am an adult, bikini and ponytails notwithstanding. So I stay focused on the ocean and dive in. Let some actual girl answer that call and swim toward the buoy. Immediately, I realize that something is not right. Something is very, very wrong, but it's not a wrong I understand. Some things feel good and some things feel bad, and sometimes you're hit with an interesting or a fucked up, but rarely are we struck by anything brand fucking new and so weird we can't physically place it within our scope. All I can liken it to is an electrical storm focused entirely on what you thought was you, what you thought belonged to you. I swim to the buoy because I'm no pussy, but I am now a dumbass rolling fish that doesn't know how to deal anymore, having been struck by lightning under the surface of the ocean. A body-wide cattle prod, shark stick, Poseidon's joy buzzer, revenge. Somebody threw a car battery into the sea. Electric eels, I have no idea what is happening and I'm having trouble swimming straight. My heart's not right, my breathing is bumpy and my skin is on a crawling fire. Kicking off the buoy, I hear that guy's voice again and briefly consider listening to what it's saying, but I want very much to get back to the sand and roll around there for a while in earthbound agony instead of this weird waterlogged prickling that has taken over my skin, the largest organ of my body, and some other ones too. Lifting my head out of the water, I see a guy with a clipboard dancing on the shore, kind of hopping from foot to foot. I tried to tell you, he yells. Flopping through the water toward him, I carefully stand ankle deep in this new electrified wetness and stare at him. Try to tell me what? I squint, dripping. He hops again. We never get them here. What are your symptoms? Looking down as if I might see my symptoms on me, I shrug. He checks his clipboard. Burning skin, difficulty breathing, chest tightness, muscle cramps, pain. Yes. Like a thousand knives? Do you feel like you're going to die? Why am I gonna die? You're supposed to feel a sense of impending doom. I stare at him. Jellyfish did this to me? Clinging jellyfish, we never get them here. They look like glass Christmas ornaments. I didn't see anything down there. Well, glass is clear. Can you tell me your symptoms? Should I just check off all of them? Dragging my stinging legs through the sand. Yeah, the doom one too. 
scribbling on his clipboard, he walks with me. Really, Doom? If you say so. Palpable turmoil on his face. I nod. Yeah, Doom. He brightens. Neuropsychiatric changes? Studying me carefully. Anaphylactic shock? I don't think I have that. I was starting to get used to drowning on land, tried to remember his clipboard's list of symptoms. Burning was not even close to what was wrong with my skin, more like a bunch of syringes all at once. Writing on the clipboard and then sudden concern, are you okay? Well, I'm gonna be, right? He shrugged sadly. Yeah, but it takes years. I had that happen to me too. No way. I was in Jamaica with my boyfriend and I dived in the water like we did all the time. And all of a sudden I could feel like it was just like, what? I didn't know what was happening. Yeah. And then I saw that I was in this like entire school of these, like, they look like onions. Like they were clear. You could see right through them, but oh you could see their God. little filaments or whatever they're called. Yeah. So I, I don't think it was as bad as I, like I could breathe and stuff, but I was literally like one of those cartoon characters, like swimming. It was like, like I'd never swam so fast in my life. <laughs> I'm not smart enough to swim away. <laughs> just like living through it. It's that was one of my surprises. Right. One of my surprises of the book was that you are a triathlete. Come on, really? I'm not a good one. <laughs> no, but God. I didn't, I mean, that's, to me, that's like so impressive. Like I have to, I have to force myself to like do anything. I, I just, I'm so in awe of somebody that like. That's normal. I would like to be normal. I'm a spaz. I, I'm so restless. Yeah. I well, think you know, I'm surprised. It was something I didn't know. Now, <laughs> sorry, I'm going to skip around a lot, but um, we don't have tons of time. If, if I talked about everything I wanted to talk about, we would not get time for anything well, I, else. I wanted to ask you a question because you were talking about honesty and how it's true. You you published something that is true. I don't I don't know how to write about anything that I haven't personally experienced. I wouldn't know that it was true. I wouldn't feel well obligated to tell it or uh, really like I had any business trying to. But there's a difference between honesty and truth in real life and so they they come to a book and say well honesty honesty and it's like i really don't need for you to know anything about me it's not that it's that this is the only story i'm equipped to tell and and then you know they publish it it's not unlike doing an interview where you have a conversation with someone and you think well this was what a beautiful thing and then they go behind your back and publish it <laughs> They'll be trained, <laughs> but, but then they then they misquote and like take things out of context and stuff. And like yeah, that's I'm not sure people know that we didn't actually say those things. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I mean, at least when you're writing, like you say, the 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 truth is as you know it. You know that's what it is, and it's not going to be. You know, I don't know if you had this happen with, with any of your books, but. When I was writing, I was so consumed with, you know, uh, doing it, <laughs> actually doing it and, um, you know, getting it done, making, meeting a deadline or whatever that it didn't occur to me until like it was out that, oh God, everyone's going to read this. Yes, yes. <laughs> my first book was on my front porch when I got home from tour and it was, I think it was the first time I realized that. People could read it. I'm yes. Like, no, no, that's not the point. Was that, but the first time I made a solo record, they, I sent them the artwork because I had a painter that I liked do the artwork, and they wrote my name on it. And I called them. It's like, oh no, 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 <laughs> this is not not something you write my name on. And they're like, whose name did you want on it? <laughs> and I realized this is why I had been hiding behind a band name all those years because there's a sort of cartoonifying effect, the sort of, I don't know, there's mayonnaise all over it. Nobody's actually looking at you. Very safe. I mean, that's what I found with my book, like that I realized that I had been hiding in a band in a, yeah. you know, and it was very safe. Like nobody was gonna ever see a band I was in and say, 
oh, they're so good, except for that Kathy Valentine chick. That was just not going to happen. <laughs> so I was always really safe. And it, my book was the very first time that I, at 62 years old, became me and was happy to, like, I'm glad. I, I like it. I like doing it now. I like being me. Was but uh, exposed or like unnecessarily or like that was important? What's that? Did you feel exposed? Oh, yeah. It was like I never wanted to be a front person. I never wanted to be a star. I just wanted to be in a cool band. That's all I wanted. And, you know, a book is like not only are you the front person, but you're like the spotlights on you and you don't have any clothes on and you're just like uh, yeah. very, very exposed. But at this point, it's a good time. You know, I, I'm not trying. I, I don't I'm not trying to I'm not so concerned with whether people like me or what they think about me or whether I, you know, have a bestseller, although I'm an eternal optimist and I did think I would have a, a, a New York times. Top. I was like, why not? Why shouldn't my first book be? I <laughs> but I, I, you know, I am an, an, I'm not an optimist, but I wanted to ask you, let me see. So many things I have to ask you about. I got to keep. All right. I love this so much. Okay, you talk about on page 137, this whole bit about a listener versus a fan. And I've never thought about this. And I, I was just like, oh my God, she's so right. And I don't want to alienate anybody that's right, listening right. out there. I, I, I love fans, but I, I've never been a fan. So I never knew what it was like to be, you know, I never wait for somebody's next record to come out. I never, you know, stand in line for tickets. I don't think I knew what being a fan was until in my thirties when I got season tickets to the Lakers and I became a basketball fan. And that was the only time I was like, Oh, so this is what being a fan is. Um, so, but I really liked what you said. And again, this is got to be careful because I'm not saying there's anything wrong with being a fan. It's just that I don't, I've never really known what that's like. And like music, I don't seek it out. If it comes to me and I hear it and I like it, I don't even necessarily know what it is, you know? That, that's huge. I think you're right about that. I think we're looking for moments. There is no genius. There is, there's no person who sucks. We're responsible for bringing about inspired moments. And that's what we should look for, even though there's this confusing business of music that is very different from, say, like the Baca hunter women who play water drums before they hunt, which I would say, like, this is music. Like, let's take this impulse out of the sphere of the business. But don't negate this concept of open-handed gift of pop. Like, it's short for popular. That means we really should not suck. We should be giving yeah. something that's good. And and yet I noticed this in this change in our audience that I felt was unhealthy because I had caused an inflammatory response in them. These particular people, a certain kind of person that didn't really want to listen to the music. They wanted to put us on pedestals and then knock us off. It was very yes. annoying and frightening. And like, I felt like it had nothing to do with us. That it, it was kind of insert thing of the month here. And yes. So I wanted to try and find more listeners, just pull away from that. And I'm still trying to do it. Not, not you are doing it. And I, and I just loved what you said. I, and I, I used to like many years ago, I used to sometimes like look on the fan sites at what they were saying. And I would found, I found so often what you're talking about, like people being mean, people yes. like, Oh, you should have seen that dirty look Kathy gave somebody on stage. And I'm like, I don't give dirty looks on stage, you know, or, or like reading things in and creating drama, you know, yes, with each yes. other that yes. you're at the center of and you're like, that didn't. And it, it, it seems like sometimes really toxic. So it was very freeing for you to, to read this distinction between, you know, people that listen that just really want to just love the music without buying into the 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 packaging and the personality yeah. and the I have tried to parse the elements of the each response and and I know that like I'm listener supported now and those people are they really are listeners. They don't 
I'm going to say they don't give a shit about me. And that's, that's so cool. <laughs> they know that we're electricians and we facilitate a current through their home. And it's they sort of want to meet each other. They've got no interest in us, really. We hang out. They'll walk us to our hotel or something. But I know that I can be starstruck, not by a human, but a guy stepped into the ocean this morning and there was a stingray there. And I realized I'm starstruck. Like, it's a real stingray. <laughs> It's not in TV or anything. And and I guess that would be the difference. Something where we could we create an excitement about the facsimile of something as opposed to the thing itself that is, I think, egoic, like an egoic response as opposed to a sensuous or soul response yes. that's vivid and really present and very here. It's it's realistic. And I think when we sell via fashion and trends and just sort of a momentary inflammatory like you want this right now <laughs> you, yeah. know, you, you take people out of the sphere of reality and they want that they're not they're not digging reality because it it doesn't shine the way melodrama shines but and it's got some heavy shit like actual drama in it there are a lot of reasons to avoid what we're saying would be the appropriate response and also, I think I loved, I, I think this was in your book too. If not, I was something, I, I'm sure it is, uh, or I just got it somewhere else at the same time. But it's like taking that experience of hearing something and loving it. And all of a sudden, because we live in an economy, uh -huh. right? That's you, right? That's your yeah. saying, two words. Um, it's all of a sudden, it's about product and selling. And, you know, I think it just really kind of, not only dumbs down the the relationship but that creates this separation you know one of the reasons i like twitter is because i i like that their separation is gone That's i'm not, yeah, the velvet yeah. rope. I'm not you know i'm not buying the velvet rope and i'm not behind the the vip curtain i'm like right there and if i like what you said i'm going to say something back to yeah, you right. yeah yeah i've been on twitter since day one for that reason and yeah. yes it has been sort of you know they're always the bullies are going to lean over and say what are you nerds doing give us the ball and kind of dumb <laughs> it down but then you can you can still curate and find the people who are trying to reach you in a human way it, it's really helpful right now. I started my band 50 Foot Wave based on the premise that we could take the dollar sign out of it. And there must be a fair exchange or it's unsustainable. So that kind of that adds some humility on our part. We're, we're not, you know, rich people. It's an amazing <laughs> model. It's really, it's really um, it, it's just enormous respect and, it, and it's wonderful. And the way, I mean, the way you present it, it's not like, you called it a rant at one point, but it's not ranty at all. It's That's like, really really sense, and it's super, uh, I think it's very like in tune with, with what art should be. And um, without belaboring that too much, unless you want to say anything else, I want to go on to something else I want to talk about. Um, all right. So I was also, as a, as a writer, taking in what I could take in and learn. I was really enamored of the way you deal with place. I know that you that your sons are kind of the delineations of this of the story, and yet I was so struck by place and the way you made the place where you were and the setting. And I know the whole thing is about being on the road and having this nomadic life. But when you when you were really talking about a place. It was so much a part of the story, uh, whether it was, you know, New Orleans or the desert, Pioneer Town or Palm Springs or Manhattan or Los Angeles or the island. It, you really created this whole world where that place. And I was I was enthralled with it. So kudos. Yeah, for that. And you know all about place. Like I, I'm obsessed with place kind of the way I'm obsessed with weather. I hear that's like an old guy thing. Right. <laughs> It's so real. There's so many senses to be turned on by place. And I feel like maybe that's shallow. But when you step into something like New Orleans, you get what they're talking about. There is a richness in the atmosphere that is not unrelated to the trauma and to the music. And I don't mean like the tourists wanting trumpets and shit. I mean like the real stuff of the air. 
it it God. feeds your senses. Like, and then the desert is the opposite because there's nothing in the air. It will feed your senses with space. Yeah, I could, and like we were saying this afternoon, you land in a place on tour and you get this instant vibe off it, I suppose. Yeah. And you never shake it. It's like you met someone. It's like you walked into their room instead of the other way around. And you never forget them when they really speak to you. Well, you really captured place uh, wonderfully. I mean, you really, really did. And uh, it was, it was, uh, it was really instructive for me how you just, how it create, cause these, everything is very stream of consciousness. And yet when you were parked in a place that became to me, the glue that held everything else could float around. But that well, was like, that's good to yeah. hear. I wondered if I'd introduced too many characters in the form of places, but as you know, that's our life and you don't want to turn it into a, a buzz, you know, a static that you're not engaged in. And I know there are days when you like your third day of sleep in Stuttgart when you're sick and <laughs> the shows are starting to blend. It it can be uh, a, a not a darkness, but a you can there can be a numbing effect when you try to pull away from it. And the the only cure for that is to completely throw yourself into it. And then you, then you never forget what your body was going through and what your psychology was going through. And it isn't less pleasant than a beautiful day in New Orleans or in New Zealand or in any urban center that's got people feeding into it. You, you live in it, so you feel it. It's just a matter of having to write it down where it can get a little bit like a But lit. two words. Two words, you say melting mansion, and in two words, I am, I don't know what the word is, imbued, is that a, that's, I am, I am like, I have the whole thing with two oh, words. That's, you great. Can that. that's so good, that, that was a good mansion too. <laughs> you, know, you have so many wonderful things. Um, one of my favorite lines, God, this was good. This is for the people out there, page 17. What if a memory catches fire? and drags itself off time, burns all over your forever. I mean, I had to stop and read that over and over, not because I didn't get it, but because it was so beautiful and because I understood it so well. It's and so I'd, never seen, I'd never seen it um, articulated so wonderfully. Thank you. I'm sorry, you. it's not a, not a nice place to go. No, oh, I, I I I enjoyed reading that. Right. Um, <laughs> well, I'm lightening it up here for a minute. What's the um? I am I'm born and raised in Texas, and I've lived uh, in Austin since 2006. And before that, I was born and raised, and I know nothing about these ostriches. Where the hell are the ostriches? And that sounded like at first I'm like, oh, how nice, how charming, an ostrich place. And then I'm like, wait, they're like freaking like killing them, or yeah. these bad things are happening. And I was like, I was kind of thrown with the whole ostrich thing. Number one, like, where is she? Where are these ostriches? Who's being mean to these ostriches? And what the heck's going on? Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Ostriches were okay until they were dead. I think that you know, as okay as can be um I, I don't even remember where i was <laughs> i was in texas and oklahoma i don't remember what city okay like, no country. Yeah, we know. the truth comes out yeah there were there were <laughs> ostrich ranches and so we were like traveling to all these different ostrich ranches and filming them for this documentary and um they were they were using every part of the ostrich which is good but I, it's just when it started, when the um, animal theme began <laughs> this book, like yeah. the fact that we are um, trying to live separate and even against our animal natures, sort of against children, against songs, to leave the animal nature behind. And so that the ostriches in the book were where that begins. And it obviously spins off into the lions and the chimps and the road runners and we have a lot to learn from our separating ourselves from it. In, in New Orleans, the rats living under the house and the 
the killer bees coming in. There's something that's one of the things that I I have so many things that I marked, but I can't find it. But that was one of the things that I marked was when you wrote about like why are we always at war with animals and about yeah. our animal nature and music is animal. I, I love that too. I really mean, good. you have a, a kid in front of you and you know, that, that Buddhist bell is always going off. The kid is just saying life, 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 you know, don't pull away from life. And if we're manifested, uh, then this material plane can't possibly be, be dead. This, that would be the zombification. Anything animal would be the, the life. And with a kid around or a bunch of kids around, <laughs> if you're me, there's no way you can pretend that there is a fact Similarly, I fly is right in front of you. And there's one in the first chapter, my my oldest son is a baby and I've lost him, so I'm I've only I'm only in memories of him. And there's one sentence that I actually froze on, like the line you were just talking about, was saying he's not one of our species, he's not one of us, he's the crow above him, he's the snake below him. He's not one of us. And that's when I started to think we're, that is us. Like, why are we different? Why, why are we supposed to be in this egoic strata when we have a cerebral function that could follow the animal function and, and be so facile and so beautiful in that yeah. egoic strata in the middle, that, that's the one that it, it's deadening and is dangerous and, it, it can be, like you say, it can be money, it can be cruelty, it can be competition instead of cooperation, but there's something that we need to get from animal orientation that would help us do better. Oh, I, I, I always say that animals are so much better at being animals than we are at being people. And we're yeah. animals, so yeah, wake up. It's only true, how hard could it be? Um, let's see. Okay. Can I move to another thing? Yeah. I want to say, um, I loved, and I think this would be interesting to, uh, people like, where's my little page number thing? Sorry. Oh, okay. I have to, you can read it if you want, or I'll read it, but this, okay. For the people that aren't musicians, it is a whole thing, and Kristen is wonderfully writes about it. There's a whole thing when you are working with somebody that is mixing your music, okay? So you've written it, you've recorded it, you've put it down, and unless you wanna like really dive into the knobs and really understand you know, the frequency, the, the places where everything sits so that the listener hears it in a, in a nice way, you. Often you work with an engineer that mixes it and trying to explain them, explain to them what you want is so hilarious. And sometimes it's very difficult. Like they're like, huh? Cause you're using your own language. So Kristen's like trying to tell the engineer what's wrong or what he wants to hear in this recording. The snare is lame. It's snappy and way too loud. My vocals are grating. They're snappy and way too loud. The kick is booming when it should be thudding. The verb in the, on the lead is glossy and the compression is fucking with its dynamics. My distortion sounds like a beer commercial instead of broken static. Absolutely. The bass is punchy and that's stupid. It should be fuzzy here. I don't want to hear the texture of the bass strings because they're playing off that lousy snare bite. The rhythm guitar is chunky and that's almost as dumb as tasty. The <laughs> Sizzling instead of cracking. The rhythm double is in perfect time, so panning them sounds like a chorus pedal. The backing <laughs> vocals are singing and singing as against the rules. The percussion isn't frantic enough, just clever and too. It's okay. This is just fabulous. <laughs> and I think it's probably interesting to people because they don't know what we go through trying, yeah. trying to like convey. Uh -huh. And people hear things that, you know, they think you're going to like it. And you can see their faces. You can just see the faces when you're like, <laughs> dang, you know, like, like, 
Yes, it's, yes. It's I, I have sent like uh, this my mixes to my beloved engineer Trina, who is mixing in our the, the melting mansion in the corner. She did Muses records, and I sent her a solo ones, and it was strikingly enmeshed, meaning <laughs> everything was just like a tangle of density. And that's what these songs wanted to sound like. And yeah. we just heard it and sent everything out into a part of the listening sphere, like you're supposed to do, isolate everything, make everything huge. And I called her at about two o'clock in the morning <laughs> saying like, oh my God, you ruined the whole thing. And she's like, all right, let's start over from the beginning. You never know what the songs are gonna want you to do. One song or record. Yeah. To another, I always think I know what I want to do when I walk in. I'm like, I know which mics I'm going to use. I know which amps I'm going to use. I know how long I have to leave them on the night before we start working. I know where the kick drum mic is going to be. I know everything, and I'm always completely wrong. Like, have you ever heard a record before wrong? And I love that. It's because each song is like a kid. It's like you can't dress it up yeah. every day and tell it what to say every day, right? <laughs> I try to avoid it by like, I try to record things, you know, and make them sound how I want them to sound. I don't want somebody. So when I send it, I will even say, I made this sound the way I want it to sound. Your right. job is to keep it sounding that way, but make sure you can hear it in proportion to everything else the right way. And then that's where the whole language gets in the way because inevitably they'll start changing the way it sounds. And I'm like, yeah. no, no. I did it that way because I like that sound. Yeah, I didn't exactly. say to go and like, fix it in the mix. I don't want you to fix it in the mix. I just want yes. you to mix, mix what I fixed. You yeah. know, or whatever. And there's some sounds which I loved for one song and I, it's just horrifying for another. And I still, I have, I love that I can't figure that out. Yeah. It isn't just an internal mechanism. It, when you are producing, you have to be aware of a song's effect without pandering to any imaginary ears. And I don't oh, yeah. know what that is, to sit in a song's effect when, you know, every measure but part is an odd sensibility. Yeah, and it's hard now because, you know, half the people might be listening on their phone, you know, and yeah. it's, it's like to, to, yeah. to try to make something that sounds good, you know, on this and sounds good on your stereo and yeah. in the car and on your, what you call it, ear pods, air pods, whatever they're. Um, so yeah, it's, it's something else. We used um, to cram into Trina's cab and her truck. Just like <laughs> It would be like 400 degrees in there, my whole band. I guess so. That's the best test. Um, I think before, I, th I don't want to get too uh, far along without at least touching, because this is such a huge part of the story on motherhood. And um, I'm, number one, I'm in awe. I, I'm, I'm a great mom to one daughter. I cannot even fathom how mothers are mothers to more than one like how you how you parse out that attention and that and keep track and all of it i mean how you just keep track of them and especially that boy energy so as a mom to mom i'm in awe hats off to you and um, <laughs> i have four only children essentially they're all five or six years apart and they weren't boys they were people so I learned so much from them and they were always kind. Like you say, you didn't butt heads with your daughter. Like I, not a single eye roll, not a tone of voice that was anything but kind. Like, and how many years have I been in my, like 30 something? I really lucked out. It was not hard. And they have all apologized. They've all come to me and say, we hear that children are very difficult and we're sorry. We're sorry, we weren't easy. Exactly, <laughs> it's like biological imperative, dude. And you weren't easy. It was important, so it wasn't hard. It was everything. And there were times when, you know, because 50 Foot Wave goes on very late at night, solo I play early, throwing music kind of in the middle, 50 Foot Waves, you know, we're loading out at two or three in the morning. 
and the baby would be up at five or six in the morning and I would think I'm going to die. Yeah, yeah, I can't. <laughs> you know, I I think I'm going to die having it all. <laughs> I cannot imagine. I mean, I, I took my, a toddler and baby on tour. I tried it a, a couple of times and uh, it was like worlds colliding. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's just, and but I did, you had a lot of support from your band and I felt like I didn't have that. Mm -hmm. So it's even harder, but uh, yeah, that's, it's, I think it's a, a fantastic uh, thing that you were able to do your music, do it your way and still, without sacrificing being a mom because i see so many women you know a lot of times people ask me like why aren't more women in bands why aren't more women doing this and i think a lot of times it's because it's so hard to do both for women yeah. like a lot of times you know a guy will become a dad and then he'll go okay see ya honey i'm going on tour and, yeah. and it's harder for for moms to do that so i think it's a, a really strong and positive and wonderful example. And I'm really glad you put this book out so that well, you know, so. musicians, you know, young women who are become that are embarking on this life can see that they don't have to not be a mom. And you don't have to be you don't have to be pink. You don't have to be kids you know remind you not to live like well like douchebags do I guess. Like Yeah. But you don't so have to be awesome. like a huge star with like a like a whole, you know, big piles of money to do it either like a lot of it's 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 one thing to you know be Hart or Chrissy Hind and take your kids on the road yeah, but yeah, to do, yeah, yeah. you know I, to you know, wait, a, on a plane once and she said you're the other lady who tours pregnant and I thought oh, yeah <laughs> she said isn't it wonderful <laughs> like kind of <laughs> it's also really hard but i can't quit my job just because i'm pregnant i'm pregnant all the time but the fact that they my kids were raised with so many different kinds of people around them speaking all these different languages and uh, being from different you know demographics socioeconomic realities and they they lived a very wholesome and yet sort of exposed to actual earthly existence life that they, so they're ill suited to um, life itself, I suppose that now they're all grown up and saying to me, but this isn't the bus. I was like, yeah, that's why the bus. <laughs> like, well, what do we do now? Like, it's hard here. It's like, yeah, there's some bad stuff out there. There's some judgment and some hatred. Bad stuff. I don't want to. I don't want to spoiler, but that story about the the hanging clowns and then what happened with the where you had to like with the. I don't want to like blow it for anybody, but that story was like like that's like totally. I mean, it's mind blowing how that even happened. That you're like looking in the. You know what I'm talking about? The yeah, clowns. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was a crazy ass story. I love yeah. that. I, I have that marked. And then the, when the, I just the story with the when the bus had to be towed away and like waiting a day and a half and like you know scavenging for through. I mean that was. I mean there was just so much, and I can't say I don't want to give it away. I don't want to give it away. But you guys, you have to. If you haven't gotten this book, you have to get it. You have to read it. There's so much. And I, there's so much humor. There's so much heartbreak. There's, I mean, there's the way Kristen writes. I mean, I, I just can't even say enough. Oh, you're an angel, sweetheart. Thank you for reading. I really appreciate it. I have felt so guilty about what I put my children through because it was just for music. What the hell is music? I still don't know what it is. And they had to live through it. It's not just dead clowns. <laughs> They were like shooting at us and they went through <laughs> so much just because of this intangible. So, yeah. But as we, as we talked about though, that's a whole set of tools. I mean, it's like, I mean, that's, you give them a, everybody needs a toolkit to go through life with mm -hmm. and you know what, the way you are raised that, that becomes your toolkit. And, uh, you know, I was like, I was not raised at all. I was left to take care of myself. And you can look at it one way and go, oh, 
poor Kathy didn't wasn't parented. But to me, it made me like feel like I'm wired to take care of myself. I never think anyone's going to do it. And I'm, I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful that that's how I'm wired. And there's another toolkit from being completely secure and feeling taken care of. And that's probably an awesome tool to have too. But um, that's not mine. You know, I don't have that set of wires. <laughs> I don't have that wrench. Um, I want to take a question because the time is going crazily fast. Um, I'm going to read this question from, I don't know who it's from, but they say there's a whole part about knowing, but not knowing your bass player after your PTSD was resolved. Is that how it felt with all the people that you know, except your children? Has that feeling disappeared or is it something you still feel? Um, PTSD was due to having my son taken in the, which is what happened in the beginning of the book. And um, all, all it did was create triggers in my life that would associate me with this event that I couldn't put into the past, like any PTSD. So uh, this event happened in the summer. So anything that was like summer would be a trigger. A child crying would be another trigger. Um, but I didn't know my, my bass player because I had never seen him clearly, I suppose, which is um, just a human danger. I don't, I've never really suffered any mental illness. I've been misdiagnosed a bunch of times, but PTSD is just a coping mechanism. And when I was cured, it meant I had no ability to um, disappear, to dissociate any longer. And it made music very hard, but people, People were there. I just wasn't looking close enough. <laughs> All right. That's a good answer. Um, another question. Um, Deborah wants to know, have enough years passed? Are y'all okay? Oh, that's so nice. Yes, I suppose. I think the end of the book was just a few months ago. And I think they were already selling it. And I was <laughs> like, you guys better hope that I don't delete this whole thing. <laughs> uh, but yes, the years passed and it's better now. Everything is better now, except that all the babies are grown up. The real baby just turned 18 a couple of weeks ago. And uh, so Kathy and I have to start a support group now. <laughs> yeah. I think that I'm going to be, um, I think that being a mom takes up a lot of emotional space and I, I don't think I've been uh, as, I think I'm going to be looking to really nurture friendships more than I have. And I mean, I was all friends before and then being a mom, it just took up a lot of, I, I don't know. I didn't feel the need for, it's not like I didn't have friends. I have friends, but it's like, this is going to be, it's going to be a different sort of thing. I'm going to be really, it's like when I went through a um, divorce or stuff like that, like sometimes you really need your friends and sometimes you find out that you haven't invested enough time in them. And I feel like I'm going to be doing that a lot. That's, that's a good plan. I like that. <laughs> I'll come on. <over>. <laughs> Let's see. Um, somebody asked, oh, Heather asked, she's curious how you now hear music and write music and and how that's changed for you since you integrated. I, um, I thought I wouldn't be able to play anymore, but I had to uh, do a promo tour. It was all booked and I, for throwing muses, um, Purgatory Paradise Records a few years ago. And I had told a, a BBC host that, you know, what had happened before we did this interview. And she said on the air, could you play something? And I looked at her like, I hadn't touched the guitar since I had integrated. And somebody like ran across the studio and grabbed one and handed it to me. And I didn't know what was going to happen. And, and I, it was awesome and also kind of nothing, I guess anticlimactic, but it didn't burst into flames or anything. <laughs> I, could, I looked down, I could see my hands playing for the first time. I wasn't like spiralized off into space. And I knew, I didn't 
just know all the lyrics. I knew what they were about. I was reliving the stories. And I afterwards, I was psyched. I was like, this isn't evil. It's just a song. And I looked up, smiling at her, and she's crying, and she's making that sign that means, keep talking, I can't talk. <laughs> but ever since then, you know, I guess the only difference is that I'm fully present. Unless I, I sometimes I disappear, but... It's not through any illness or anything or because or fear. It's just that, that that other part of me is much better at playing music than I am. <laughs> um, I'm curious, uh, how do you, do, what are the parallels for your, when you write a book and write a song? Like what's the same, what's different? The I used to hear songs. That, that's what the last question was referring to. I would. I didn't think they were coming from me. So I heard them and I would write them down and I would sort of learn them. And now I just know how they go. I I can walk into the studio and just put down the guitar part, put down the vocal part. And that seems to freak people out more. <laughs> it's like, all right, what's not weird for y'all? <laughs> but writing prose I, it just takes longer to get to that point. I think it is like that eventually, but it's like, first you have to build the Eiffel Tower with toothpicks. <laughs> then yeah. you have the Eiffel Tower. With a song, it, it's already there. It's just hovering around. Crows, as you say, it, it takes work. Yeah, it's a lot more work. <laughs> a book's a lot longer than a song. Yes, uh, and how, how can you make it perfect? It seems impossible. This one was five years of just plowing through every sentence over and over and over again and going, well, maybe I'm wrong now. <laughs> well, I'd, I'd like to give a shout out to UT Press, which published both of our books and allowed us both to write the books that we wanted to write and yeah. how fortunate we were that to have a publisher that wanted us to do what we wanted to do. And that's Absolutely. really rare. And they think so, like I do, they'll say things like, well, do you think this semicolon alters the breath? And it's like, oh, thank you for being in my head. And yes. <laughs> Was it Gianna that came to you and approached you for your book? For yeah. The, the, you did for them? Yeah, me too. Thank you, Gianna. Thank you, Gianna, we love you. Yes, we do. It changed my life. You really did. Absolutely. I've been through a lot with that woman. She is a she is a hero. Um, let's see. We could talk more or we could take another question. There's a couple um, let's see. I guess I oh there's <laughs> Gianna says, I'm so creepy following you ladies around. I just want to know why uh, Kristen gets a paper clip and I don't get shit. Yeah, I, I get a paper clip. It was free. Sticking it to the man big time. Something's wet on my back and I don't know what. It's so weird. <laughs> okay. Somebody, I don't know what happened to my chair. It's really weird. Um, would you like to go live? Would you like to go back to living in a bus? I do live in a bus. <laughs> when it's not a pandemic, I'm still there. I'm in the van. <laughs> and yes, I love it there. Would you? Would I? Um, depends who I'm on the bus with. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, always, yeah. I'm thrilled to see my bandmates every morning. I lucked out. Yeah, yeah, it really depends. I mean, yeah, there's there's something there's something about a bus and there's something about a hotel room that the the same kind of delight that a kid has, I still have. When yeah. I get on the bus, uh -huh. you know, I still feel like a kid when I get on the bus. I still feel like a kid when I go into the hotel room. And yeah. there's just something special and magical about it. There's and I've had that since I was little. I remember when I was 10, one time our air conditioning broke in our house and my mom said, we're going to go stay at a hotel. <laughs> and I thought, we went to the Hilton. It was the fanciest hotel in Austin. <laughs> and I thought it was like, I mean, I decided it was so great that I changed my job, that my, my coveted job was then to be a hotel housekeeper. 
I wanted, I thought yeah. if I am a hotel housekeeper, I can always be in a hotel. A hotel, that's great. That's I think that part got edited out of my book, but I was like, <laughs> it was crazy. I went from like wanting to be like a scientist or a president, the first woman president, to wanting to be a maid at the Hilton because I thought it was such a great thing. Yeah. <laughs> I still worship those people. Uh, okay, let's find another question. Um, Let's see, or we can talk more about things I want to talk about because I'm going to be honest, you guys, some of these questions, I'm not into them. Sorry. Some of them I am. Uh, let's do this one from Rodney. Um, he wants advice for budding songwriters. And since we're both very different writers, I think it might be interesting to see what we both say. You go first. Advice? Advice for budding songwriters. <laughs> Um, I think my process is too odd. I wouldn't recommend it, um, except uh, do it. Don't don't let people do it for you. Write your own songs, and then find out what how it feels when you aren't telling the truth, and no one can lie to you anymore, because they like to lie. They they yeah. like to uh, they like to steal your wallet or they're lying to your face. <laughs> don't let it happen. Write your own songs. I think that's uh, something we would we would have in common that I would say is right from the heart, you know. Uh, yeah. When I wrote Vacation, I was 19 years old. It was something I felt for real. It was real. It wasn't mm -hmm. the most brilliant or deep thing, but it was real and it was from the heart. And I believe that that's why it has resonated for decades and why people yeah. like the song. I believe that, and yeah, um, right. so I, I would agree with you. You know, be 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 true and be real, and you know. And then all the other stuff, avoid cliches and, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're uh, going for a timeless, the only way to do that is with energetic. There, if there is a, a truism, if there is a real life, the song has to be written, then there is an energetic at play. And that will resonate with the people who need it. I think so. And, you know, break the rules. Learn the rules. Yeah. And then break the rules. <laughs> Um, let's see, we're, we're getting up to an hour. I'm okay with time. If you want to go another few minutes or it's getting dark in my world, <laughs> which I'm right up, with too. <laughs> right now, for a, look, look how I can go ghosty. Woo! Look at you. Um, yeah. You can just brighten your screen up, Kristen. Okay. Somebody said you talked <laughs> about space. What about time? Uh, my, um, my That's book is all about time, and sure. it's not in a good way. Um, I like fucking with time. I think it's important. We incorporate here as these beings who are conscious. We're aware of what um, is fucking with us, and one of those things is being finite entities. One of those things is seeing the end and knowing that it's coming, not just of ourselves, but of anything. And I don't want us to negate entropy as something that uh, we can be aesthetically aware of. There's beauty in time. There's beauty in fucking with it. And um, that's essentially what my book is about. As much as I like place, fuck with time. Well, don't they, they, go, they go hand in hand, time and and space and place it's all it's all part of um part of the yeah, deal we have incorporated again um let's see i love this okay this is the first thing that that's that grabbed me into the book this is the very first thing that made me gave me a clue as to what i was reading and what i was in store for taking the baby was supposed to kill me but mothers can't die so that plan didn't work. I'm alive and disappearing instead. No one knows what to do about that, least of all me. Um, and that's when it became very clear what was happening. And I mean, it was clear right when it happened, when I mean, you're very, you're, you're, it's not like vague at all, but that, that again, you just kind of, that it's it's water. I feel it seeping out of you. I feel that that the the confusion and the the complete loss. And my heart was just like 
pounding when I, every time you return to driving in the car with the empty car seat in the back. I mean, for, I mean, any mother is just going to go into a complete panic at the thought of that. Yeah. Yeah. That it was hard to start a book in complete panic. So yeah. luckily it, it softened with the dreamscapes that we soften our reality with, but you know, not entirely softened. You can't soften that blow. And if, even just having a child and realizing, oh, now I can't die. That's hard for everybody. Yeah. Um, I think we're winding down, but I'm going to say one, a couple other things. One of my very favorite lines, it, it just, you said in five words, you summed up my entire life philosophy. The universe is a yes. Oh, good for you for having that philosophy. It took me a long time. <laughs> well, you know, it's a yes until it's a no. And then when it's a no, then you kind of didn't want that anyway, did you? You know, you <laughs> but I, I, I try to think in terms of abundance. And again, that's part of my childhood. We had nothing. And yet the terrible things that were supposed to happen didn't happen. And and my little kid brain, it was like, we're not going to the poor house. My mom was from England and used to talk like, you know, like Charles Dickens. We were going to go to the, the poor house, you know, please, sir, may I have some more? And uh, it, it never happened. So I think I just started not believing it and thinking there is enough. There is enough. Mm -hmm. And I, it might just be like a um, nature. It certainly wasn't nurture, but nature that mm -hmm. I just thought there's enough. Well, so sometimes there's enough rain, enough tears, enough cold, enough hunger. That's a hard point to get to. That that characterization of abundance often serves our comfort level, but life doesn't. So we have yeah. to get to that point where we can say, well, this is an awful lot of emptiness right now. This is an awful lot of sadness. I have abundant tears. And that's when it becomes not breaking down. But that's also where time comes in because you know, you know that it's going to pass, you that's know, true. Just, and it really becomes about tolerating. And it's like, can I tolerate this? I don't have to accept it. I don't have to make it go away. I don't have to move past it. But in this moment, can I tolerate this, yeah. what I'm feeling? And that is such, uh, you know, a, a, a mind opening and a, freeing thought like like i don't have to i don't have to do anything but just endure that's beautiful as a dissociative there were times when i didn't do that and that's not fair we're not here to disappear we're here to tolerate and engage yeah um okay let's see what do you want to do kristen this is your thing Should we oh. oh we could always pull dan back um I, I, uh, one more thing. I love your beehive analogies. I love the beehive, the swarming bee, <laughs> the, the analogies with just the corporate, uh, the corporate entities, uh, the record company people. I haven't had to deal with that in a very long time. You know, I'm not, I'm not as working of a musician as you are, not from lack of wanting to be, but um it's just it's just one thing I'm I'm glad is not a part of my life. I'm really yeah, glad that I, I, I left many, many years ago. I, I realized what they were about and said, you know, it's it's time to make a deal. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> well, um, do you have anything else you want to say? Because you're no. getting you, you I mean, I know you don't want to disappear, but you're kind of disappearing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we need your screen. We need your screen. Don't disappear, like, Kristen. I could call me, the arm, but then I wouldn't be hiding anymore. <laughs> so, um, I'm good, and I so appreciate you doing this, sweetheart. Well, I loved it. It was, it was a, a pleasure to to get to know you. I did a deep dive, uh, like like I was saying before. I mean, I know songs without even knowing who they are. And when I started diving into a lot of the music, I'm like, 
Oh, I know that. I know that. But it was like, because I don't have that kind of like, who is that? I need to know more, more, more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know. And plus, there was a whole huge, I'm, I'm kind of behind musically, like, in a lot of the 90s, I was kind of discovering jazz. And so I kind of like, I, I discover things at different times. So like oh, a lot of stuff great. I come to like decades later and it's fun. That's the magic of music. It doesn't ever lose its, its impact or unless you have a bad snare drum sound, uh, it, doesn't, <laughs> it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't lose anything. Yeah, that's uh, true. And now we can get music from, from time out of the ether, which I just love. I know I'm not supposed to, but I love it. Um, somebody wants to know what our favorite songs are. I mean, I've, I've, I don't know. I don't even know names of songs. I would, I would have to like, that's, I, um, I go blank. So sorry about that. You know, <laughs> the others are favorite, but um, I think maybe we should get Dan back in unless you have a burning desire to keep going. No, nope. I mean, I'm that was beautiful. Hi, Dan. Hello. <laughs> thank you both so much Kathy thank you so much for a wonderful interview I think yes, this you another career for you <laughs> am, I good for, am I good at this? yeah, yeah. You're, that's amazing <laughs> I'm going to be a happy nester I'm going to need a lot of things to do so send, send your, your authors my way <laughs> uh, thank you both thank you Kathy for the only if they're like Christian though <laughs> <laughs> Kristen, thank you so much for your time and your talent and for putting this down uh, on paper again. It's a, it's a wonderful book. Um, just to recap, everybody, uh, you can purchase a signed copy of Seeing Sideways at the green tile at the, at the center or bottom of the screen uh, or at booksoup.com. And we also have signed copies of Kathy's wonderful memoir, too, yeah, that I ever wanted. And you can purchase uh, one or both uh, at booksoup.com. And just to let everybody know when the broadcast ends here in a second, uh, it's going to save. It'll take about a minute and then it will live in the archive. So uh, if you miss the beginning of the program, you can watch it from the very beginning uh, immediately after we end. Uh, thank you both for your time and thanks for being here. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Good night, everyone. Good night. <laughs>